Okay, in the previous lecture, we talked about um, rotational kinematics, meaning the motion of an object as it rotates about a single object, about a single axis. So the object, in some sense, rotates in a plane. You could call it the xy plane, and the axis you could call the z axis. So we're going to continue that discussion today, um, and we're going to introduce rotational kinetic energy. So that's our goal, to be able to do conservation of momentum, pro conservation of energy problems, where um, we include both the translational energy, which we've already talked about, but now also uh, an energy associated to the rotation of the object. And in order to do that, we need to introduce a new quantity called rotational inertia. That's the analog to mass that we have in translational motion, and I'll sort of show you where that comes from in the uh, overview at the beginning of the lecture. Um, we'll talk in detail about how you calculate rotational inertia, which is also called the moment of inertia for an object. Um, so we'll do some examples with for that, um, and we'll have some equations for solid objects that we just have to look up or find on an equation sheet. Um, and then we'll end by talking about um, rotational energy, specifically rotational kinetic energy, and do a conservation of energy problem. I want to start out um, by remarking on what we'll talk about next time, which is that um, topic of rotational dynamics. So if you remember from the beginning of the course, we talked about um, the kinematics of motion of particles. So a ball traveling through space um, has a certain kinematics. It's the way that we describe its position, its velocity, and its acceleration. Um, and then we talked about dynamics as Newton's laws the explanation of that motion um, by forces. In particular, we had Newton's second law, which was, of course, the sum of the forces on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration of that object. That's Newton's second law. So we say that that's the dynamical equation that explains the motion, where the motion, the kinematic motion, is the acceleration, and the force is the explanation. You, you act with a force on an object, it changes the velocity of that object. Well, next time we'll talk about how there's a, an analog to this in rotational motion, which we can write like this as the net I lost my pen. Okay, here we go. The net torque, and we have to say in the z direction, is equal to this quantity i times alpha z. So we've already seen this last quantity, alpha, when we started talking about rotational kinematics. That is the angular acceleration. So we can write that. angular acceleration of an object about some chosen z-axis, um, and that thing means uh, the change in the rotational velocity over the change in time. That's the way that we calculate the average angular acceleration. So um, just to, to set up the picture, uh, you can imagine that we had like a, a rod or something, or maybe a board. Let's make it a board. So here's a board, and then there's some axis about which it rotates, and we call that the z-axis, and we consider only motion, only rotation in the xy plane. So um, maybe it looks like this x and y here. So we're only considering the rotation of the object through the xy plane. So it will have some omega in that plane. That's sort of a bad sort of hard to see what that means. The omega, I mean, is within the xy plane. So at some later moment, the board might be over here. Um, and then the angular acceleration would be um, either in the same direction or in the opposite direction of omega. And so we call these omega z and alpha z, meaning the angular velocity and the angular acceleration about the z-axis. Um, so the dynamics of a particle say that a force acting on a mass changes its velocity. Well, the same sort of thing is true for the rotation of an object in the xy-plane about the z-axis, except that you say that a torque 
on an object causes an angular acceleration. And what that torque is, is it's a force applied at some distance from the axis. So this is our axis, the z-axis, and you could apply a force at various places. For example, maybe I could apply a force right here. Um, that's pointing sort of in the y direction. Um, and that will cause some angular acceleration of the object. You can see that if I applied a force like that, then it would cause the object, for example, when starting from rest, to start to rotate in this counterclockwise direction. Um, I could apply a force in a different place, so maybe I could apply a force here. Maybe the same magnitude force, but applied at a different location. It turns out that those two forces will give different values of the torque. So the torque will depend not only on the force, but also on the location at which you apply the force. And of course, you know this from your everyday experience. If you go to push a door open, um, you'll get a better rotation of that door if you apply the force as far away from the hinge as possible. If you apply your force right next to the hinge, then it's very hard to open up that door. So those are the basics of rotational dynamics. And the reason I bring it up now is because we need to talk about this second term, which is called the rotational inertia. So uh, TZ, tau Z, this is actually the Greek letter tau, um, tau Z is called a torque about that Z axis. And I is called um, the rotational inertia or sometimes the moment of inertia. And again, it's about that chosen axis. So we'll see that it changes depending on the axis that you choose about which to rotate the object. So what does I mean? What does this quantity mean? You can sort of understand it if you think about um, what the M in Newton's second law means. Um, I mean, we think about M as sort of the mass of the particle, as sort of the amount of matter in the object or in the particle. Um, but in Newton's second law, it serves a very precise role, which we could call the resistance to the acceleration. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you had like two masses here, um, some little m and some big M, and big M is larger than little m, then if you come up to that object and you press on it with a certain force, F, um, you could do that to both objects, same force, but depending on the mass of the object, sorry, I can't, I need to make my force vectors look nice. Depending on the mass of the object, you'll get a different acceleration for the same force. So what should my acceleration vectors look like in these two pictures? The force vectors are the same, but the acceleration is given by um, this equation. So you could even rewrite this as the acceleration vector is equal to the force applied divided by the mass. So if, you're, if you have a smaller mass, then you get a larger acceleration. And if you have a bigger mass, you get a smaller acceleration. So you can see that the mass acts as sort of a resistance to being accelerated. It takes more, it would, another way of saying it is, it would take more force to give the larger mass the same acceleration. But you can also think of it as same, same force, smaller acceleration with larger mass, and that's because of this equation. We could look back at the first equation, same force, larger mass, means that acceleration must be smaller. So um, mass, we sometimes call inertia. You may have heard that before. We haven't talked about it much before, but the mass of an object is often called the inertia of the object, and that's what it means, resistance to its acceleration. So in, in Newton's second law for rotation, um, the rotational inertia serves the same role. So we have this torque Z, it's really the sum of all the torques, is equal to I alpha Z. So this is the angular acceleration. This is the sum 
of, we could say, the rotational forces. And this is the resistance to angular acceleration. So it'll turn out that if you have an object which um, has a larger moment of inertia, um, and we could represent two objects with different um, moments of inertia as two rods of different lengths, then um, it'll turn out that uh, the first one, uh, when you apply the same torque, so if you remember from what I said above, a torque is a force applied at a distance from the axis. Well, if I apply them at the same distance from the axis, these would be the same torques. Um, but the rotation of the inertia of the first one is larger than that of the second one. And that will mean that the angular acceleration of the second one will be larger than the angular acceleration of the first one. And that would be true even if the masses of the two rods are the same. So maybe they're made of different material and they have the same mass, but because one is longer than the other, the, mo the moment of inertia could be different, and therefore one will be harder to rotate than the other. Um, so we'll see exactly how to define that rotational and inertia in a moment, and I'll try and uh, show you some examples, some, um, some experiments that you can do where you can actually feel the difference in the rotational inertia. Um, uh, but that's the qualitative idea there. And one last thing I want to say in this overview is um, that the kinetic energy of a rotating object can be just simply written down knowing the translational kinetic energy. So we call this the translational kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. We just make an analogy. Let me, let me draw a squiggly arrow because it's not really a precise um, implication, but the rotational we can write by analogy as one half. Well, what is V? Oh, geez, it's one half mv squared. Um, what is the analog of V? Well, V is velocity, so the analog is angular velocity, omega. And what is the analog of mass? Well, mass is inertia, so we have rotational inertia. So this will be the equation that we write down later in the lecture and that we'll use in our conservation of energy equations. One more piece in the overview is just to remind you a little bit about rolling objects. We talked about this briefly last time. In particular, we talked about the idea of rolling without slipping. Um, here we want to make clear um, the different possible cases for an object that rolls. So rolling without slipping, let me remind you, is like you have some object with a circular cross section. So that might be like a soup can. So it doesn't have to be just a two-dimensional circle. It could be a three-dimensional object that has a circular cross section. Um, and you allow that thing to rotate along the ground like this. And if you um, assume that it rolls without slipping so that the, the side of the object doesn't slide against the ground at all, then if you mark the object with a little arrow here, then the side of that object will exactly kiss the ground on some exact same length. So at some moment later, um, let me copy this object. At some later moment, it might be sitting here, and that arrow marker could be pointing up here, maybe. And that's because this length here is exactly the same as this length across the ground here. So we said, as you may remember from last time, um, the s value along the um, arc of the circle here must be exactly equal to the x value along the ground. So that's the condition of rolling without slipping. And what that means is if you, if you take the difference over time, then delta s over delta t is equal to uh, delta x over delta t. Delta x over delta t is what we call the velocity of the object. 
So we, in fact, we call it the velocity of the center of mass of the object, meaning that the center of this object is moving through space with some speed. That's the velocity of the center of mass. And then um, delta s delta t we can write using that um, angle, that sorry, that arc equation that looks like this, where you have some arc and you have some r and you have some theta. The relationship between these quantities is s is equal to r times theta. So I can write this left-hand side of the equation as delta um, r theta, delta t. And because the r doesn't change, r final minus r initial, that, that's the same thing. So I can just pull it out, and we get delta theta delta t, which is actually r times omega. And that's equal to v center of mass. So we had this equation which relates um, the angular velocity about the center of mass to uh, the translational velocity of the center of mass. So you have an object that um, moves through space with some translational velocity v. That's the velocity of it along this path. But then you can also imagine if you just watch that wheel going around, it has some omega about its center of mass, about the center of it here. And the relationship between those two quantities is given by this equation here. That's under the case of rolling without slipping, and that's the only one we've considered so far. But there's two other cases. Um, we could call the next one rolling while slipping. Um, so, for example, um, uh, I guess rolling's the wrong word. We should really call it like translating, because it's really not rolling what I'm considering here. Um, imagine that you are um, going down the highway and your car is rolling without slipping. No problem here. Um, so your wheels are going around and you have a translational velocity like this and there's no skidding of your tires at all. But then you see a deer ahead of you. No oh deer, gotta draw a deer. And you slam on the brakes. Okay, what happens then? Well, then your wheels lock up. And so in the next moment, what you'll have are a translational velocity that is maintained. You still have the velocity of the center of mass of the car, but you have no rotation of the wheels. So you're just sliding along, burning rubber across the ground. So this would be the translation of your wheel without slipping. And you can imagine that that, that can happen. There's no problem that can happen. In that case, this equation does not apply, of course, because you don't have this, this special kissing of the wheel to the ground. Instead, one piece of the wheel is just sliding across, and you're burning the rubber off of that one piece of the wheel with the friction between the wheel and the ground. So that's one option. And then the other option is, um, we could call it slipping without rolling, um, uh, or without translating, I guess I should say. So what does that mean? Well, in that case, it's like your car is um, is sitting on a patch of ice. And so you press down the accelerator, and your wheels go around. So you get some omega here. Um, but uh, the v center of mass is equal to 0. So you just have your wheels spinning around on that ice. So that's another option, is that you could have a, an, an object that simply rolls simply spins about its center of mass, 
but the object doesn't move at all. And we'll have to consider that when looking at problems to try and decide which of these cases um, is appropriate to be used. Um, in particular, it'll be important when we decide to choose um, what sort of kinetic energy appears in the problem. So if we have a V center of mass, if we're moving through space, then we'll need to include the translational kinetic energy. And if we have um, a spinning wheel, then we'll need to include the rotational kinetic energy. And if we have both, so if we have, for example, rolling without slipping, then we have to include both of those things. So that's what these three cases give us, are the possible ways of including that. So um, I've just written down here at the bottom, um, we have a kinetic energy associated to each particle of the mass. So this is the way you should sort of think about it as coming out of Newton's laws, that there are like little pieces of mass within any object. So multiple little mass pieces here. And those little objects, um, they could be ro rotating and moving through space, and they will have their own little velocity. So we could call this like uh, V1 and this M1. So M1 has its own velocity M, uh, v, V1, and that means that it will have its own kinetic energy. Well, um, in order to account for the velocity and the, uh, for the kinetic energy of every little particle in some rotating object, it turns out that we have to include both the translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and also the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass, one half i omega squared. And we'll have to consider which of these cases we have when writing that down. So we arrive at rotational inertia, and uh, we'll define it in just a moment. But first, I'd like you to try to feel it. So I'd like you to try to do um, one of these two experiments um, by finding something around your house that you can that you can try this out with. So one option is to take a broom. So I've sort of drawn a picture here of what I mean. Grab a broom by its handle, and at first try to grab it sort of near the end of the broom, near the, the non-bristle end of the broom. And I want you to hold it, so grab it tightly, so that you can hold it horizontally, right? So that the broom is parallel to the floor. And then rotate your wrist so that the broom um, goes through a cir circle or a part of a circle. And what I want you to pay attention to is the difficulty with which, it, the difficulty it is to make that thing rotate. How hard is it to make it rotate. For example, if the broom is just sitting there at rest as you're holding onto it, and then you start to rotate it in one direction, and then as you try to rotate it back in the other direction as you twist your wrist. Focus on how that feels. And then I want you to change. So then I want you to um, now grasp the broom at sort of its center of mass. So you can imagine where that center of mass is. Actually, you can do an experiment to find the center of mass. It's going to be the place where, um, it's probably a little further out, it's going to be the place where if you hold it, it will exactly balance. So the center of mass, it turns out, is the balance point for any object. So now you're going to be holding it about this axis here. So in this first picture, there was a vertical axis and you're rotating the broom about that axis by keeping it horizontal. And in the second case, we again have a vertical axis, but what we've done is we've moved its location along the object. So now, rotate it again horizontally, so keep it in a horizontal circle, and see how that feels. And then go back and forth. So try to rotate it from one end, and then try to rotate it when you hold your hand directly at the center of mass and see how those two cases feel. Let me give you one more experiment. Um, you could try to rotate a book. So if you hold a book down by your side, and it would be good if you could take a book that has some length to it, um, then you can imagine that you could hold it in a couple different ways. Um, so here's our book, and it's a little bit long. And your hand could come down and hold it at the very end so you like wrap your fingers around here. There you are. Again, try and rotate it in a 
circle so that the book remains horizontal. So you're going to try and rotate the book like that, and you could do that just by rotating your wrist, right? Try and make that, that book rotate. It will look like it's going to rotate about this vertical z-axis. So you're rotating the book around that. And then you could change the rotation in the same way that we did for the broom by holding it in a different spot. And of course, in this spot, what I'd like you to do is to sort of find the center of mass. Imagine that there's an axis through that, so your arm comes down and wraps around right there across the center of the book. So you're again uh, choosing two cases. One is you're trying to rotate it where you're holding on to sort of the end of it. The other is where you're holding on to the middle of it. And you want to compare how it feels. How easy is it to rotate it? Or more precisely, how easy is it to change the rotational velocity? So to start it rotating or to change it from going clockwise to counterclockwise. How easy is that angular acceleration to do? So now that you've done that experiment, let's talk about what you observed, or what I hope that you observed. Um, I think that there are two things that you should notice. One is that the resistance to the rotational acceleration um, is different between those two cases, that it changes depending on where you hold it and depending on um, where is the axis of rotation. So um, I might bring in a demo for you in the classroom where um, you can take a meter stick and you can attach to the meter stick like two, I don't know, 200 gram masses. And then you can stand there and you can try and rotate it exactly in the same way um, horizontally. That's a bad horizontal circle. I mean something like this. So you rotate it horizontally. And in this case, and in both cases, you could rotate about um, this axis. Sorry, I guess this, this is really what I want to say for the second statement. So for the first statement, the question is, um, or the, the observation is that the resistance changes depending on how you hold it, meaning depending on where the axis is through that rotation. Um, but the other thing that you can see is that um, the reason that you're getting something different for the rotation is that the mass is distributed differently about the axis in these two cases. So in, the, in, in these two cases on, on the left, you have lots of mass far away from the axis of rotation. Whereas on the right, you've sort of tried to balance it out so that as much mass as possible gets close to the axis. So you sort of have um, less points of mass that are far away from the axis. So I've summarized that here as the resistance to rotational acceleration is smallest when you minimize the distance of each piece of mass from the axis of rotation. So the experiment that I wanted to show you in the classroom is you can take these little masses on the meter stick and you can move them very close to your hand where you're rotating and that will feel like a small rotational inertia but then if you um, move those masses out to the ends, then you're putting lots of mass far away from the rotational axis, and that will be a large rotational inertia. So this is I large, and this is I small. So those are the two qualitative ideas. The first is that I depends on the axis that you choose. So the same object with the same mass can have different values of rotational inertia depending on where the axis sits. And then the second statement is that in some sense the distribution of the mass away from the axis is what determines the value of the rotational inertia, it is what determines the resistance to rotation. So let's write down the specific precise definition. If we have a collection of point particles, so um, I'm usually going to represent these as little uh, points of a certain mass, and then maybe we'll connect them because the objects that we're talking about um, are uh, rigid objects. So we'll connect these objects here. Um, 
and then we're going to rotate them in the plane. So we're going to have a z-axis, and I'm going to choose, um, so let's say that this is the xy plane here, the plane of the page, and I can choose this point as my z-axis. It's coming out of the page, for example. So I can rotate this object about the z-axis here. And the moment of inertia, the resistance of that object's um, of the resistance of that object to rotation will depend on the little masses, m1, m2, m3, m4, m5, but it will also depend on their distance from the axis. So this I'll call r1, this would be r3, this would be r5. So it's not a vector, it's just a distance from that rotational axis. So the definition of the moment of inertia is m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared plus dot 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 m n r n squared for how many objects we have. And as I showed in the picture, um, r i is the distance from the ith mass, m i, to the rotational axis. Okay, so um, that's just the definition. Um, and you can see that uh, the qualitative things that we observed on the previous page sort of appear in this, meaning that if you put a lot of mass at large r values, then you'll get a larger i value. So if you increase these r values, i will increase, even if the m values stay the same. Um, and, um, and it will depend on where the axis is, right? So I chose this to be the z-axis, but if I had chosen a different place, like over here, then you could see that all of those r values would change, and therefore the i value would change. So those two qualitative things hold up in this. Um, so how do we write that? Well, that sum that appears here, we can write um, in, a, in a mathematical compact way as just the sum over little n of mn uh, rn squared. That just means the sum of these terms. It doesn't mean anything different than that. Let's do an example. Uh, let's actually do a couple of examples. So I've drawn a few of these objects. Each of them has um, a couple of little point particle masses, and all the point particle masses are the same mass value. We'll just call it little m. And then I've characterized the object by, for example, the length of the side. Um, in the first case, we just have a rod with two masses. We have a square with four masses, and then we have an equilateral triangle with three masses. So um, I want to do two parts. One is to calculate the moment of inertia, or the rotational inertia, inertia about an axis that passes through the center of mass. Um, that's not uh, uniquely defined in some of these. So let's say that we're going to do it through um, uh, an axis that's actually parallel to the plane of the object for the second two as well. Um, OK, so let's try it out. And then we'll try it uh, through a different axis, one that goes through two particles. So in this first case, here is our object. And I'm going to draw a rotational axis that goes through the center of mass. So that little red dot um, we know is the center of mass of the object. It's the point at which the rod would balance if you were to hold your finger there. Um, and so now we need to calculate the moment of inertia. So moment of inertia is equal to the sum of the mr squareds. So we have two masses here, so it's going to be m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. So what are those things in this case? Well, m1 is m, and m2 is m. So that's going to be m. And what is r1? Well, r1 is this distance here. It's the distance from the axis to the first mass. And that distance, r1, is just half of the length. So we have m1 is m, r1 is l over 2, and so I can write this as l over 2 squared. Now what's the second one? Well, m2 is also just m, and r2 
is this distance here, but of course that's exactly the same. It's also half the length because I've chosen to place the axis at the halfway point, at the center of mass. So this will be L over 2, but then you have to square it. So what do we get? Well, we get um, 2 times whatever this thing is. It's going to be ML squared over 2 squared, which is 4. So that's going to be ML squared over 2. So that will be the moment of inertia of this object about that particular axis. Okay, let's try the next one. Um, so we'll choose um, an axis that passes through the center of mass. So that's the center of mass of this object. And I said it wasn't uniquely defined in the question, um, meaning that I could have an axis that comes out of the page at this point, but I could also have an axis that points like this, and I could also have an axis that points like this. So even parallel to the plane of the object isn't precisely defined, so I'm going to choose this one. So um, sometimes when we draw this axis, we also draw the omega about the axis. So you, when you draw the axis, you want to imagine that it'll be rotating like that. So our i in this case has four masses. So we have m1, r1 squared plus m2, r2 squared plus m3 r3 squared plus m4, r4 squared. But if we look at just one of them, we can see that uh, it's going to be the same for all of them. So m1 is equal to m, and r1 is equal to l over 2. Again, l is the length of the side. And that will be the same for m2, and for m3, and for m4. So in fact, this equation becomes sort of simple. It's 4. You get for each of those masses the same term, and that term will be m l over 2 squared. So what does that become? Well, it becomes 4 times m times l squared over 4, which is, um, I guess, just m l squared there. So this one will have a larger moment of inertia, a larger rotational inertia than this one, twice as large. And in this case, it's simply because there's twice as much mass. It, it doesn't change, nothing changed about the distance of the masses from the axis. Okay, let's look at the last one. Um, and so in this one, let's, um, so our center of mass is here. Um, and let's, in this case, uh, make that a rotation about an axis that passes through the plane of the page. So our z-axis, in this in this case, we'll assume is perpendicular to the page, and this thing is just rotating in the xy plane of the page. Um, okay, so then what do we get? Well, we have three masses, so our i has three terms, m1, r1 squared, m2, r2 squared, m3, r3 squared. And if I just look at this one here, then the r is going to be this distance there. So what is that? Well, I guess we need to find it. It's not so easy to find. Um, so we're going to have to do a little bit of geometry here. So um, we were given that this l is that length. And so that means that um, I could draw a triangle that looks like this with L on one side and L over 2 on the other side. And um, where exactly does that sit? Is that the best way to do it? I'm not certain. I guess I should probably do it in a different way. Um, so let's assume that this is L. Oh, let's do it for this one here. Here's our L. Here's the dot in the center. And then we have an isosceles triangle that looks like this. So this is um, the R that we're looking for. And um, I could make a right triangle out of it like this. 
and then this I could call um, theta over 2. So in this picture I have theta for each of these angles is equal to 60 degrees. So it looks to me like I have a right triangle with one side L over 2, another side R, what I'm looking for, and an angle theta over 2. So what do we get from that? Well, that will be um, cosine of theta over 2 is equal to L over 2 over R. So that means that R is equal to um, L over 2 over cosine theta over 2, it looks like. So let's plug that into the calculator, see what we get. Um, so um, basically I need to find out what cosine of theta over 2 is or what cosine of 30 is because this thing will become, well, let's write it, let's write it down here. So I have m for m1 and then my r is going to be um, l over 2 times 1 over cosine 30 degrees and that whole thing will be squared. And then the whole thing will be multiplied by 3 because we have the same thing for each of those objects up there. So let's figure out what that is. So what is um, 1 over 2 cosine 30? That's what we want to find. So 2 times cosine of 30 is um, 1.73. So 1 over that is 0 0.577. So this will be L times 0 0.577 times 3. So that will be, what is that, times 3? 1.73 times, oh dear, that's not right. I lost a square in there. So um, we have 0 0.5774 squared and then multiplied by 3 is almost exactly 1. Seems like I must have done that wrong then. I get 1 times ml squared for this object. Well, that's interesting. I didn't expect that to happen. So why is that true? Do you see? I don't, really. It looks like each of those masses contributes a factor of 1 third ml squared. I guess it must mean that the the L is uh, the square root of 3 times L. The R is the square root of 3 times L. I guess that's why. Well, that's a nice little result. Okay, so that's the first part. That was to use axes that pass through the center of mass. And now we're going to do a second part, which I guess I need to add myself a page. So the second part, we will uh, let the axis go through um, two of the objects. That's what we were asked. So in the first case, we have this little guy. And now we need to take an axis and draw it through both of these masses. And therefore, the axis must look like this. So we have an omega that goes, spins around, and the rod is just spinning like this. So what is our i? Well, i is equal to m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. This is m1 and m2. And we don't need to calculate much because we get m times 0 squared plus m times 0 squared. The distance of each of these masses from the axis is 0. Neither of them are, are any distance from the axis. They're both sitting on the axis. So the moment of inertia of this thing is 0, meaning that it it doesn't have any resistance to acceleration. Now, if they're not point particles, if they were little spheres here, then there would be some resistance, and we'll talk about that in a moment, what the moment of inertia of a solid object of some extent is. But this equation that we've written down is for point particles. So these points literally sit directly on the axis and have no extent away from the axis. OK, let's look at the square. So now we have this object, and we want to draw an axis that goes through two 
of the masses. And let's make it simple for ourselves and just go here. So we're going to be rotating about that axis. And uh, we have a, a moment of inertia due to um, an axis that passes through two of them, but then has two of them further away. So what do you think? Do you think that um, this case will have a larger moment of inertia or a smaller one than this one up here? So you can see that there's going to be two masses that contribute zero to the moment of inertia, whereas this one had four masses that contribute to the moment of inertia. But these two masses are going to be further away than each of those were. Well, let's see what happens. So our moment of inertia is going to be equal to um, m times 0 squared plus m times 0 squared for the first two. And then we add to that m times l squared plus m times l squared for the other two. So this is like r3, and this is m3 here. So that's what gave me this term here. So our moment of inertia is 2 ml squared. And what did we get on the previous one? Over here, we got just plain ml squared. So this thing has a higher moment of inertia. Um, even though it's just two masses that contribute, it's going to be harder to rotate this object about this axis than it is to rotate the same object about the central axis. And that is sort of, um, I mean, in a very simple way, that's exactly the book experiment that you did, where if you put your hand to, toward the end of the book, then it's harder to rotate that object than if you put your hand at the middle of the book. Book doesn't change mass, but its rotational inertia uh, changes depending on where you place the axis. And finally, we have one more. We have the uh, equilateral triangle that gave me so much trouble in the previous one. Um, now we're going to draw an axis that goes through two, so something like this. It's going to rotate about it, and you can see that there's only one uh, mass, which is off axis. And oh, I have to do some more trigonometry because the distance of that mass from the axis is this thing. We could call that R3. This is M3. So our moment of inertia is going to be um, M times 0 plus M times 0 plus M times R3 squared. And what is R3? Well, I have this equilateral triangle. This is my R3, and um, this is theta, which is 60 degrees, and this is L here. So what do we get from that? Well, sine of theta is equal to R3 over L, or R3 is equal to L sine of theta. Okay, so that's not what we had last time because in the previous case, R was the hypotenuse. Now R is just a side. Um, so what do we get? We get, um, so this I becomes M L sine theta squared. So this becomes M L squared times sine theta squared. And what is that? Let's look it up. So it's sine of 60. And squared is 0 0.75. So that's our new moment of inertia. So um, this particular arrangement of the equilateral triangle will have a smaller moment of inertia than the one that we had up here. This was 1 times ml squared, and this is 3 quarters times ml squared. So again, same object, but different axis gives you a different rotational inertia. Now, um, our definition is for point particles. So you, you, you make an object by putting together point particles. But the way that we'll want to use it most of the time will be to look at um, solid objects with a continuous distribution of mass. So um, in some cases, that's easy to get from our equation. So the, the simplest case is that of like a wheel. So you can imagine that it's just a a thin wheel made out of wood or something like that. 
And if we want to find the moment of inertia of, of that object about um, its center of mass here, then the I value is just going to be equal to the sum of all the little mass pieces times their distances from the axis. And the reason that this one is simple is because, well, I can chop it into pieces. Chop, 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 chop. And I could look at one particular little mass. This is like our nth little piece. And its distance from the axis is that little distance. But that distance is exactly the radius of the wheel. So this equation becomes, well, I have the little mass, mn, and then I have rn squared, but rn is just r squared. So what that means is that you have like mn, or sorry, m1 r squared. Sorry, uh, if we look at every other piece, what do you get? Well, you get mn plus 1 and rn, but that's exactly the same. It's the radius, and the next one is also the same. It's the radius away. So all of them have the same distance from the axis. So then this equation becomes m2 r squared plus dot dot dot, all of them. And so that means that you can pull the r out here as a common factor, and the equation becomes r squared times the sum of the little m's. But what's the sum of the little m's? Well, that's just the entire mass of the whole thing. So if we have a wheel with some mass m and some radius r, then our equation for that is I hoop wheel is equal to m r squared. Oops, don't know what happened to that. There it is. So that particular one, we can actually use our equation to do it. Um, there's one more case where we can do that, um, and that's anything that looks like this object in cross-section. So if you have um, like a cylinder, like a soup can, and then you rotate that about an axis through its center of mass, um, and you also have to make sure that it's, it's the rotational symmetry axis, um, then you can see that for this little piece of mass right here, it has a distance r from the rotational axis, where r is just the radius of that cylinder. And that would be true for every single piece of mass in there. So if you just add up all those masses and their r squareds, you get exactly the same thing that we had here. So I, for, um, I guess we could call this a hollow, oops, not spelling that right, hollow cylinder is also equal to the total mass of the thing times the radius of the thing squared. So those two objects we can actually find. Um, but in most cases, um, for solid continuous mass objects, um, the summation that we're doing here, this adding up of the little m r squareds, is something that's possible, but it requires um, calculus. It requires something called the integral. So in this algebra-based course, we're not going to do that. We're not going to try to do it. If you want to go take calculus and come back and take calculus-based physics, we would actually do those calculations. Um, but instead, we'll just write them down. So I'll just draw some pictures of what these things look like. Um, so if we have um, a solid disk, so this is no longer, that's a bad picture. How do I draw a solid disk? Still bad. I don't know exactly how to draw this. It's a solid disk, and I'm going to again rotate it about its center of mass in an axis um, that's perpendicular to it, so that's the symmetry axis of it. Um, if we rotate it like this, then it turns out that the equation is equal to 1 half mr squared. And you can calculate that using calculus. So we see that up here, if you put all of the mass a distance r away, 
from the axis, then you get mr squared for the object. But if you take some of that mass and start to bring it in to sort of fill in this circle and instead spread it evenly throughout the disk, then the i is equal to 1 half mr squared. So the idea is if both of these two objects have the same mass, but all of the mass is at a distance here and all of the mass is spread out here, then this one has a smaller moment of inertia. And that's what we would expect. Um, the same thing is true for a solid cylinder. So if you have um, just a solid cylinder like that, and you again rotate it about this symmetry axis, so you're talking about rotations like that, then you get exactly the same equation. So this is also for the cylinder, solid cylinder. Um, we could talk about a solid sphere. So imagine that this is not um, just a circular cross section, but it's actually a sphere. And then you could draw an axis through its center of mass, and you could rotate it about that. In that case, if you try to go and look at all the little pieces of mass and add them up, what you would find is the equation for the solid sphere is 2 fifths mr squared. So again, the m here represents the total mass of the object. The r represents the radius of the object, and that's the same for both the sphere and for um, the disk here. Now, um, if you have a spherical shell, um, meaning, I don't know if I'm going to be able to draw this very well, all the mass sits out at the edge. So we still have spherical size. I can't really draw that very well. Um, what do you think? What would happen to the moment of inertia? Will it be smaller or larger than the previous one? Well, think about what happened with the disk and the hoop. Um, if I take a solid sphere and I take some of the mass that's on the inside and start to push it out toward the outside, then basically I'm getting larger mr squareds for those little pieces. So they have the same amount of mass, these two objects, let's say, but this one has all of the mass out at this distance. So it should be that this has a larger moment of inertia, and the equation for it is 2 thirds mr squared, which of course is larger. 2 fifths is um, like 40%, it's 0 0.4, 2 thirds is uh, 67%, it's 0.67. So this is a larger one. And then finally, the last one um, that we'll talk about is uh, a rod. And the rod, um, so I'm going to write down the equation for rotations of a rod of a length L and mass M. And we'll do it again about the center of mass of the object. So all of these have been rotations about the center of mass. So you put a little dot at the center of mass, and it turns out that the moment of inertia of a rod about the center of mass is equal to uh, 1 12th ml squared, where L is the length of the rod and M is the mass of the rod. So that's our equation there. And these equations will be provided for you uh, on an equation sheet. Uh, it's just important to know that they, that they exist and what, when to apply them to which object. Um, if you know these equations for the, the moment of inertia through the center of mass, then there's something called the parallel axis theorem that can give you a formula for the moment of inertia through a different axis, as long as that axis is parallel to the original one. So um, the equation here is I is equal to I center of mass, that's the equation that we found on the previous page, um, plus MD squared, where D is the distance of new axis from old. So this is the equation. This is the equation for the parallel axis theorem. So let's see how it works. Um, if I have a rod, 
the equation that I found before was an equation for the rotation of that rod about its center of mass. So about an axis that passes through its center of mass, this kind of rotation. But what if I wanted to take the same rod and rotate it about this axis, about its end? That's no longer through the center of mass. Well, we can see that the moment of inertia should be larger, right? Because I'm taking some pieces that were close and I'm moving them further away. It's sort of like I'm taking these pieces and moving them over here, so I'm increasing their mr squared values. So the i in this case should be larger. But what is it? Well, we can just use this equation. So i of the rod about the end um, is equal to by the parallel axis theorem. So why am I allowed to use the parallel axis theorem? Well, because I already calculated it for an axis that goes through the center of mass, and these two axes are parallel. So I'm allowed to do it. So what do I get? Well, I get the i about the center of mass. So that's i rod about center of mass. And then I have to add to that the mass of the rod times the distance between the two axes. So the distance between the two axes is this distance here. So our equation is going to be 1 12th ml squared. That was, our, that was what we found right here for the rod. But we didn't find it. I just wrote it down. Um, and then we add to it m, the total mass of the rod, by d squared, which is l over 2 squared. So what is that? Well, that is. Um, we have 1 12th ml squared, and then we get an ml squared divided by 4, 1 4th ml squared. Well, I can make a common denominator if I just multiply this by 3 over 3. So this is 3 twelfths there. So we get 4 twelfths when we add it together. I lost my addition sign. 4 twelfths, and that's 1 third. So it becomes one-third ml squared. So the equation, i of a rod about end, is equal to one-third ml squared. So you can find the moment of inertia of a rod about its end knowing what its value is about its center of mass. And as you can see from comparing these two results here, um, 1 12th is smaller than 1 3rd. So um, it makes sense that this thing has a smaller moment of inertia than this one. This one will be harder to rotate. Let's do one more example for the parallel axis theorem. Um, if you have a pendulum with like a large spherical bob, um, I guess I should have drawn it more like a sphere um, then we could look at the rotation of it about this axis. So um, this is z perpendicular to the page here. And um, if that hinge point where it's swinging um, is some distance l from the center of mass of the sphere, well, we already know the moment of inertia of a sphere about its center of mass. We wrote that down. So we called it I sphere, but it was I sphere about center of mass. That was 2 fifths mr, MR squared. So what is the moment of inertia of the pendulum? So this is like the um, uh, the pendulum that's sitting outside of Padnos. It's a big, huge ball. That one probably isn't a solid sphere. It's probably a hollow sphere, but we'll just do it here. Um, and that ball is swinging about some long axis here. So the rotation here is like this, whereas the rotation in the previous case was like this here. So in, instead of rotating about its center, it's now rotating about an axis that's even far away from it. Um, but we can still calculate it. So what is the moment of inertia? 
well, it's going to be i about the center of mass plus m d squared, and that is 2 fifths the mass of the pendulum bob times the radius squared plus the mass of the pendulum bob times L squared. And that's it. That's the moment of inertia of a pendulum, and that tells you um, the, the re resistance to the rotation of the pendulum about that axis. So last topic is rotational kinetic energy. Um, most of the reason we defined rotational inertia was so that we could get to this point. Um, and the idea is that when we account for the kinetic energy of an object, we have to think about the kinetic energy of every tiny little piece. So if you had like a wagon wheel, um, which has like spokes and a rim, um, then as this thing rolled down the street, for example, so imagine that it's rolling like this, it also has some center of mass velocity. So it rotates about its center and it has some center of mass velocity. And you could think about it as a whole bunch of tiny little pieces of mass, so this tiny little piece m, which has its own um, velocity vector, v, like that. And then you could go through to every other little piece throughout the wagon wheel, and you could calculate the particle kinetic energy as 1 half mv squared for every single little particle. But what you'd have to do is you'd have to figure out what the actual velocity of each particle is, which comes about both from the center of mass velocity, but also from the rotational velocity. So for example, um, a particle at the very top here will have a large velocity to the right because it'll be the addition of its rotation plus its translation, whereas a particle that's touching the ground, it must have a zero velocity because it's rolling without slipping. So it's not sliding at all across the ground. Its velocity relative to the ground is zero. So that seems like a very complicated problem. If you want to find the total kinetic energy, you have to add up all the little particles inside. But it turns out that it has a very simple uh, result. And that is that the total kinetic energy is equal to the translational kinetic energy of the whole object plus the rotational kinetic energy of the whole object. So the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass and the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass. And those two quantities are 1 half m v squared, where this is the total mass, and this is the uh, speed of the center of mass. And then you add to that the rotational kinetic energy, which is 1 half i omega squared, where omega is uh, rotational velocity about the center of mass. And i, of course, is the thing we've been talking about all day. It is the rotational inertia for that particular object. Let's just make a little side note here about the wagon wheel once we're talking about it. Because of the way that the moment of inertia equation is set up, so this is just a side note. Because of the way the rotational inertia is set up, um, I is equal to the sum of mr squared for all the little tiny m's and r's in there. Um, you can actually think of it as I of piece one plus I of piece two plus dot dot dot, meaning you can group together all of the little masses, for example, in the wagon wheels spoke and call that one part of the moment of inertia. And you could group together the wagon wheel itself, like the wheel part of it, and call that another piece of the moment of inertia. And then you could group together like the little ball at the center. So for the wagon wheel, I wagon wheel, it's going to be equal to, looking at my picture, I guess six times the I of the spoke, and that's about its end, because our rotational axis is right here, 
So each of these little spokes is like a rod rotating about its end, plus I of the hoop, which is the outer hoop here. Oops, the outer hoop here. So you can uh, break up a moment of inertia in a nice way like that if you know the moment of inertia for, for uh, different particular geometric objects, you can create larger objects and the moment of inertia you just add together like that. So I just wanted to mention that while we have this picture of the wheel. So uh, kinetic energy of the total object is the translational uh, kinetic energy of the total object plus the rotational energy of the total object. So when we do conservation of energy problems, uh, the conservation of energy equation is this. It says the initial mechanical energy becomes either final mechanical energy or it's lost to work, um, where work is done by non-conservative forces like the friction. Um, so the only change that we have to make in order to do problems like this is to simply realize that the kinetic energy has two parts. It's the translational kinetic plus the rotational part and we still have the potential energy there. And the translational is 1 half m total v squared, and the rotational is 1 half i. Sorry, I should be a little more careful with that. i omega squared. So our kinetic, our kinetic conservation of energy problems will change in that we now have this rotational kinetic energy term. Let's do an example of it. So um, this is an example that we've tried out before, uh, where we have an object that goes around a loop-the-loop. -loop. Um, but now we're going to allow it to be a ball that can roll. So the idea is that we have some track that comes down and goes through a circular loop-the-loop, -loop, like this. And it's going to be a solid sphere so that solid sphere has some mass, m, but it also has some radius, rs. I'll call it rs because I'm going to call the radius of my loop just r. And it's going to roll without slipping. So we're gonna, it's going to have an initial velocity of 0, but then when it's anywhere along the track, it will be rotating with some omega about its center of mass, and it will also be translating. It will have some translational velocity through, and we'll assume rolling without slipping. And let me remind you what that means. It means that we can write omega is equal to r times v here. The translational velocity um, is given if you know the angular velocity and vice versa. Um, and I should say not r, but rs, the radius of the object there. So the question is, um, how high do you have to release this sphere in order for it to go all the way around the loop the loop? And part of that question is a circular motion problem. So let's take, let's start there. So the circular motion problem says, um, how do you know that it's actually going to be okay when it gets to the top here? And what that means is that it will still have a normal force. So if you remember, we've done this before. There's going to be a force of gravity and a normal force. That's the free body diagram for the object. The acceleration vector will also point down, meaning towards the center, because its velocity is tangent to the circular path. So if we do Newton's second law there, F net, so at top, F net is equal to M A. I guess I should say capital M because that's what I chose for my sphere. Um, so what is that? Well, that's going to be the normal force plus the force of gravity is equal to M A. And because it's a circular motion problem, I choose the special axis, the radial axis that points outward from the center of the circle. And in that direction, um, 
everything is negative. So we get, um, well, let's write out the whole thing. FNR plus FGR is equal to MAR. That's the component equation. But the FNR is negative, so we write it as minus the magnitude. FGR is negative. And of course, AR is the thing that we know. It's minus B squared over R here. Um, so when it's just about to fall, meaning at the minimum velocity that it can have, um, the normal force will go to zero. So let's, let me write this out a little bit more clearly. So our basic equation is Fn plus mg plus mg is equal to m v squared over r. And what you can see is if I let the v get smaller and smaller, then the only way to make the left-hand side get smaller and smaller is for Fn to get smaller and smaller. But at some point, it will break contact, and then Fn will go to zero. And at that point, you can't get any smaller. It just means it doesn't go around. It doesn't have contact with that anymore. So we write that out by saying that V min at Fn is equal to zero. So we can say Fn is zero, and then we have Mg is equal to M V min the minimum possible speed at the top, squared over r, which means that v min squared is, what well, we can divide both sides by m, multiply both sides by r, and we get g times r, or v min is equal to the square root of g r. There. So that's the circular motion problem that tells us the necessary speed that we need at the top in order to um, get all the way around. And now we need to do conservation of energy from this moment to this moment in order to figure out what the minimum height is, what's the potential energy that is needed to have the kinetic energy that you want at this point. So let's check it out. So our conservation of energy equation is mechanical energy initial is, uh, we had the work non-conservative, and that's equal to mechanical energy final. So um, work non-conservative, we're going to assume to be zero, meaning that there's no friction. And no friction is a little bit tricky here. What I mean by no friction is that there's no kinetic friction. There's no sliding of the object along the, um, along the track. So what I really mean is no work by friction um, because uh, the object rolls without slipping across the surface and there's no sliding of it, there's no work being done by the frictional force. So we just get mechanical energy, energy initial is equal to mechanical energy final and mechanical energy is kinetic plus potential and kinetic this is the new part, is kinetic uh, translational plus kinetic rotational. Okay. So what are our initial and final positions? Well, initial is going to be when it's at the top, and final is going to be when it's at the top of the circle. So we can go through and we can make some simplifications here. Um, because it starts from rest, it has zero velocity and also zero omega. So omega is equal to zero and v is equal to zero. So I don't even need to write those down. The potential energy initial is going to be mgy initial because it's only due to gravity. And then the final kinetic energies I need to write out. So these are going to be 1 half m v final squared. And um, when we say v final, we mean the speed that it has here, which we called the minimum allowable speed. So I'm going to call that v min. And then the rotational, 
is going to be 1 half i omega min squared. And then we have potential energy. Um, so if I'm going to have a y, I really need to choose what I mean by that. So I'm going to say that my y points upward from the base of the hill. So that means that I'll I'll say that the potential energy is not zero at the last point, but it's mgy final. So my y initial is my unknown h that I'm looking for. And then I have um, 1 half mv min squared. And my y final will be m, uh, my, my potential energy final will be mg um, y final, which is 2 times the radius. That's this height right here, 2 times the radius. And now we need to look at um, the new part about the rotational kinetic energy. So I is I for the solid sphere. And I for the solid sphere, we know, is 2 fifths the mass of the object, the radius of the object, so Rs, squared. Omega is the omega that you get when the object rolls without slipping. And so rolling without slipping gave us this equation right here. And so if we want to write omega, it's just rs times v min. And then that thing is squared. Mm, that doesn't seem right. Yeah. Everything's wrong. OK, let's check. So rolling without slipping was not this equation. I'm going to have to cross it out just to make it dramatic for you. That was wrong. You probably saw that 10 minutes ago. It doesn't work out with units. It turns out that v is equal to r times omega. That's what works out with units. You see, I don't remember any of these equations, so I just have to logic them out every time. So um, this works because v is in meters per second, omega is in per second, but you multiply it by meters. So that's the rolling without slipping condition. So I need to change it down here. So my omega is actually um, v over r. So it's going to be v min over r sphere squared. Um, and that leads to some nice cancellations. We have a 1 over r squared in the denominator. That cancels with this r squared in the numerator. And then we're going to have a v squared. And what we get is, well, let's look. We have mgh is equal to 1 half m v min squared plus, and then we have 1 half times 2 fifths times m v min squared. And we have mg times 2r. OK. We have more cancellations, because look, we have this definition of v min, which is square root of gr. So we have mgh is equal to 1 half m. And then we get v squared, which is just gr. And we have the same thing here. 2 cancels out, so I get 1 fifth mgr, and then I have 2mgr. If I combine all of that, what do I find? Well, I can divide both sides by m, that little m and big M, those are the same things. I can divide both sides by g, because it appears in every term, and I get h is equal to r over 2 plus r over 5 plus 2r. Oh dear, I'm at the end of a page. Uh, so what is that? Well, we need a common denominator. So let's make it the common denominator 10. Um, so I multiply this by 5, multiply this by 2. But you can't just multiply 1 by that. You have to multiply by 1. And so this I have to multiply, I guess, by 10 over 10. So what do we get? Well, we get 5r plus 2r plus 20r 
is uh, 27r over 10, which is 2.7 times r. So where do you have to release the sphere? Well, you have to go 1, 2, and almost 3, a little bit less, 2.7, in order to get to a point where it will actually make it all the way around. Um, let's think for a moment what would happen if it wasn't rotating. So could you release it lower, or would you have to release it higher if it was just sliding, um, let's assume, without friction? Well, let's look at this, at this equation right here. So you have some initial um, potential energy. So the initial potential energy is your initial mechanical energy. In the case that um, there's no rotation, then you wouldn't have this term. You'd only have the translational energy term. So it's like the potential energy, in this case, has to go to two places plus the potential energy final. Um, so what does that mean? It means that you need to raise it up to a higher level in order to get the same v min. Because for every v min that you get when it's rotating, you also have some omega min, meaning that it's going to have to, uh, if you have some initial amount of energy, it has to go into two places, the kinetic energy of translation of the object, but also the kinetic energy of rotation of the object. Um, so in order to make it go around as it's rolling, you would have to raise it higher. If this was just an ice cube that was sliding, then you could release it from a lower point. Okay, that's all for this lecture. Next time we'll talk about rotational dynamics.